acknowledging as a panel that we're guests to Hawaii Nei, visiting for the purpose of offering this knowledge on behalf of our respective communities, uh, particularly in the Himalayas. So we offer this uh, hoya aina to honour the land as that which feeds, and we offer our respect to the generations of kanaka ui, whose knowledge systems and lifeways shape and care for the lāhui. So today we're talking about a few different important works that have come out of the Himalayas, and without further ado, due to timing, uh, we'll be going through talking each of us. Um, Pasang Yang Yushub is going to start us off, followed by Kalzang Guji Bhutia. I'm Amy Holmes Takshin Darpa. I'll also be speaking for Charisma Lecture. Mabel Gergen, Elspeth Eruru, and uh, Sarah Smith. And so all of us, we can give our email addresses afterwards <laughs> and all these sorts of things. Um, and, you know, and for the purposes of um, accessibility also, any questions, um, we're very happy to help out with spelling of words or anything afterwards. So we'll get started with passing Okay. Um, so the title of my brief presentation is Indigenous Representation, Indigenous Presence, and Rewriting Indigenous Futures, The Road Because of Dean Wilson. Um, inspired by Sebastian Villeneuve's works, I will say a few things on these topics. Uh, and my brief response today is actually going to be based on my lived Indigenous experience as a Sherpa woman, as somebody who is currently living and working on Muslim land, uh, as an uninvited guest in so-called Vancouver, Canada, and also, most importantly, as a Sherpa mother who's motivated to create a livable future for all. So, when I first uh, learned about the movie, Ningma Sum, it was the nose ring that actually caught my eye. I had never seen anything like it before. A beautiful woman, visibly from the Yakum nation, traveling through time and space. This almost a shock to my system was showing to me what an indigenous future, an Adivasi future, can look like. The shock was a result of a deeply internalized and normalized erasure of indigenous peoples and the continuity of settler colonial framework within studies on indigenous peoples from the Himalayas. So in this context, we have Ningwa Sum and Ladam Matayim, which we are going to be watching. And contrary to the colonial perspective of indigenous peoples as a historical, endangered, dying, and dead, Subhaske Villembu shows that clearly this is a story of survival and living into the future. The indigenous vitality evoked here is the aliveness and the strength that comes from surviving beyond multiple predicted extinctions. And here, the technology of, of relations is harnessed. The possibility of imagination science fiction offers is perhaps why Subhash chose this medium to make multiple leaps forward into the future beyond what mainstream sci-fi in the intellectual centers have even been able to imagine thus far. So Subhash coined the term Adivasi Futurism, influenced and inspired by Afrofuturism and Indigenous Futurism from the Turtle Island. This relational approach to indigenize the future and to grow our beloved community, and I'm, for personal reasons, remembering Bell who's here, is an invitation for us to review and redefine progress by delinking progress from the idea of nation states and the colonialist narrative of indigenous peoples as primitive. And these are words uh, that Subhash offers in thinking about uh, Adivasi futurism. But the question important, uh, that is important for us to be thinking about is, are we actually bold enough for that? Can we actually even say the I word? Um, I was going to make a joke, but maybe later. So <laughs> indigenous, and, um, indigenous and South Asian studies without being afraid of the nativist charge and without surrendering to the co-optation of the indigenous. So these are the questions I offer to you. Another thing I'm struck by, or I was struck by Ningwa Sum, is the remarkable visuals of the place that tell the story of interplanetary and interstellar civilization of the future. The shots were taken in what Subhash refers to as the Sherwa nation. And as someone from that nation, Ningwa Sum has encouraged me to read my memories of our place to rewrite our future so we can be who the place made us to be. So where does the road beyond Ningwasan lead us to? Who are we taking along with us? And what do we leave behind? What does the future, multiple leaps forward, look like? Indigenous representation matters. 
I cannot help but reflect on what I witness and experience so frequently in the intellectual centers, the academic spaces I work in, as I'm thinking about Ningma Sum. It is still rare in 2024 to find meaningful engagement with indigenous scholars from the region in the supposedly liberatory, decolonial, and more than human advocacy scholarship. The ones that see us, but feel the need to speak for us without actually listening to what we have to say. For example, I'm struck by the recent publication on the vital matter, citing top decolonial scholars from every part of the world, but without a meaningful engagement with a single one from the region in their framing of vitality. In the shining literature about indigeneity in South Asia, the ones algorithm will tell us are important because everyone is <coughs> citing them, I cannot help but ask, where are indigenous peoples? When are indigenous peoples more than passive research participants and informants? Where are indigenous peoples who have always been here? Where are the indigenous scholars whose ideas feed the mainstream? And I want to end with these questions and simply say, we are here, we have always been here, imagining and living the indigenous futures in the present now. Thank you, and also Kuzu Zambo to everyone. Kuzu Zambo, Kamrimo, Shewaro. Uh, so I'm Kalzam Doji Butea. I'm from uh, the Butea or the Hopo ethnic, ethnic community, and I'm from Sikkim. Uh, we call it Bil Demajun, the Valley of Rice. Uh, and in the lecture language, the, the first people of uh, Sikkim, uh, they call it Mayal Lea. <coughs> so my village actually is called Sidram. Uh, and it's a very neighboring village to a place called Darab, which is the center of uh, Limbu uh, <coughs> community, or uh, Yaktum community in Sikkim. Uh, it is therefore my honor to be able to discuss Nyingma Song with you all. So today my response is centered around a moment at the end of the film, which uh, we see uh, our like amazing, mighty, <laughs> Uh, Limbu astronauts, uh, Mingsum and uh, Mingsum, prepared to return to their time. So their mode of transport is the ritual dance, which I got very excited, called the Chabrum. Uh, for me, this is kind of very interesting. It's kind of very profound moment, as the uh, filmmaker uh, Subhash uh, Ji is showing us how ritual is a prime uh, travel technology that both uh, compresses and expands time and space. Very interesting. So ritual uh, gives us an opportunity to uh, both connect to ancestral knowledge and look forward to uh, how we can live in the broader universe beyond our mountain peaks and valleys. <clears throat> in the case of uh, Mixam, her travel, <clears throat> her time travel is about family connection. Uh, seeking a father in order to connect to her mother uh, who has accepted her mortality and wished to return to the mountains and the stars. So in order to trace out her father, uh, Mixon must return to her past, to a time when he, <coughs> when her people and other indigenous communities are struggling in the mountains. So many of these struggles are connected to care for the land. Uh, in the film, we see images of protests over Mukumlung, a sacred place for the Yakum people in eastern Nepal. So in the last three years, since 2019, uh, Yakum activists have asked for private companies to desist in the uh, construction of a cable car to the sacred uh, Mukumlung temple area. So this cable car is being built in the name of um, development, but this development is not a form of uh, change that cent uh, centers limbo interests or, or concerns. In, instead, uh, this is a powerful example of the marginalization of indigenous and other local groups who seek to uh, protect their 
uh, intimate kin kinship ties to the land. <clears throat> so these kinships, kinship ties are often adapted through the ritual. So in Denjong, uh, in Sikkim, uh, in my place, uh, every year we keep offering to uh, mountain Kanchanjanga. Actually, the actual name is Kanchanjanga, the third highest mountain in the world. So in wrong tradition, uh, in lecture tradition, Kanchanjanga is their origin mountain and ancestor at the same time. For Lopos, uh, my community, and uh, other Buddhists, including wrong Buddhists, which are lecture Buddhists, <coughs> Uh, he is the protector deity. Uh, in rituals throughout the year, we renew our relationships by uh, sharing our crops with him as a return of abundance that he provides to us. So one of the prayers is the Neso, uh, the prayer to the sacred habitat, which is undertaken frequently uh, throughout Sikkim and, is, and, and in surrounding areas of Darjeeling and Kalimpong. <coughs> Uh, so in this prayer, all of the seen and unseen beings of the lands are listed, and humans uh, profusely apologize for wrongdoings, including polluting and exploiting the land. So when we undertake Pang uh, Hapso, that's a ritual which is incorporated in the Nisol itself, we, uh, I say that, we, we see we are time traveling. Uh, but also, as Nigma Sum says, Time is relative, so we are also transcending time. That is, we are connecting to Kanchanjunga in a space that is both beyond time and also at beginning and end of the world, where the relationship with the mountain has been renewed. So the idea of ritual as a fuel that will propel us through space is absolutely resonant to me, because even when I'm away from Sikkim, as like traveling around, when I do nasal performance myself, uh, do this ritual, I still feel as though I am there with Kanchen Jola, and uh, I also feel as though I'm in the past um, when I did this ritual with my parents when I was growing up as a child, and in the future with all of the descendants I don't know uh, yet. So Subhash's invocation of power of the ritual is such a beautiful way to vivify why it is so important for indigenous communities as a way of knowing and also as a way to respect our knowledge, knowledge ways against those who critique, our, critique or undermine our relationships with the land. So the flame ends with uh, Mixon's cry for our ancestors to kick ass. <laughs> and I take this as a message from all Himalayan people. So that's what I have for today. Thank you so much. Okay, um, so I'm Amy Holmes Takshandarpa, and my reading of Ningwa Sung comes from my positionality, from my experience as a Pakiha Sikla viewing the film and thinking about histories of misrepresentation and erasure and how the Himalayas have been imagined over time. Uh, Sumash Thebi Lambu has written and spoken about how he intentionally disrupts these misrepresentations in the film by centering at Yaktun sovereignty and agency. My reading of it led me to think about another famous science fiction film with similar themes. The second film in the original Star Wars trilogy, Return of the Jedi, released in 1983. At the centre of that film is a struggle over sovereignty against an evil empire and the way that local communities are challenging imperial authorities. The heroes in the film are not the white protagonists, but instead are the beings who inhabit the forest moon of Endor, the Ewoks. Today, I want to think about the way that Ningma Sung both continues classic science fiction tropes, but at the same time disrupts and intervenes in forms of misrepresentation, thereby trailing, uh, trailblazing new indigenous science fictions in the Himalayas by centering different forms of indigenous agency that Ewoks had, but in very complicated ways in Return of the Jedi. So what do Ewoks have to do with the Himalayas? Surprisingly a lot, the original language of the Ewoks in the film was Tibetan and Kalmyk, recorded by the producers of the film in California in the early 1980s. A theme shared by both Return of the Jedi and Ningma Sum is the centering of Himalayan languages. These languages are part of what lend these, film, lend these films different layers of interpretation. A key difference is intentionality. The discussions of Yaktung language in Ningwa Sum have been carefully written by the director in collaboration with a leading Yaktung language scholar and author, Amarak Tumyaha. They have thus been translated with English subtitles with careful consideration of meaning and intention by the filmmaker. 
This careful process of composition and translation has at its centre Yaktong cosmologies of language and meaning. In contrast, the dialogue spoken by the Ewoks is not necessarily connected to events in the film Return of the Jedi. Uh, anthropologist Marsha Kalkowski researched the law behind the making of Return of the Jedi in the late 1980s in order to try and unravel the mystery of why the Ewoks are speaking to Ben and Kalmuk. In the film, the Ewoks ask notably, what is this, the Parede, and state, let's go, draw, 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 draw. These statements are not necessarily related to events on the screen, for when they ask, what is this, they could be referring to C-3PO, but then they begin to recite the prayer of the four immeasurables. I'll return to this in a moment, but first there are two more interesting statements in Tibetan. There is a lot of money on this side, and I am a silent person, you better leave me alone. Kalkowski argued that the first statement made sense in the dialogue of the context of the dialogue recording. So there's a lot of money this time. Apparently, uh, the producers told her that some of the people who came in to do the recording were talking about how impressive the recording studio was. So said, there's obviously a lot of money on this side. <laughs> but the second statement may have indicated what she argued was, quote, resistance on the part of the informant. That is, the person who was being asked to record was saying to the person who was recording them, I'm a silent person, you better leave me alone. <laughs> or else, it could be a response to the noisy C-3PO, and therefore this was an ironic statement. As the rhetoric scholar Tenzin Mingyur Peljan has pointed out, unfortunately, there is no discussion of the Kalmyk in the film in Kalkowski's research. However, the appearance of these double meanings in dialogue that are not necessarily in sync with the events on the screen presents an interesting way that Tibetans involved in the making of Return of the Jedi resisted a recording process that was intended to render their dialogue unintelligible or irrelevant to the plot. The appearance of the four immeasurables supports this ultimate reading. Even as the Ewoks pray, apparently to see through PO, there are different readings apparent. The white human protagonists of the film attempt to pass this off as humour to dismiss the Ewoks, but an ultimate reading is to again acknowledge that their dialogue around the prayer is entirely unrelated, which suggests that this prayer could be understood differently. In terms of the cosmology of the film, perhaps the Ewoks are praying for all sentient beings as they acknowledge C-3PO as a sentient being who is not a stupid human. This is an important alternative to the human-centric reading of Star Wars as science fiction opera, because this is also in line with George Lucas, who has said on a number of occasions that he sees the series as being a science, science fiction opera from the perspective of droids. Ning Wasung continues in this proud tradition of multiple layers of meaning in a science fiction tale by centering Yachtung conceptions of space, time, and relationships. In particular, the central technology for travelling through space and time is Yachtung weaving practice, which contains with it rich and nuanced meaning and technique handed down across time. Finally, the vision of the future conveyed in Return of the Jedi and Ning Wasung are resonant. Nicholson is optimistic, talking about a future beyond nation states, patriarchy, casteism, racism, and sexism. Return of the Jedi also ends with the human Ewoks saving the day, not the humans, contributing to the destruction of the second Death Star and throwing a really great party. However, here is when the, where these connected readings differ. Ewoks disappear after the film, appearing only in two very strange made-for-TV films in a lively animated series that are not considered to be part of the canon. In this way, they could be seen to share their fate with their Tibetan language-speaking counterparts, as US popular culture has moved away from thinking about Tibetan and Himalayan sovereignty. Ningma Som intervenes in important ways here, by showing a future where Himalayan people are sovereign, free, and powerful. In that way, the film and Subhash Devi Lumbu's second film both forge a path for a distinctly Himalayan science fiction vision. Thank you. Okay, now I'm going to read, it's my great honour to read on behalf of my good friend, uh, Charisma Kartak Lepcha, who unfortunately couldn't be with us. Um, she is writing from Gantok Sikkim. Um, so she, she writes, I apologise for my absence, but I'm honoured to be part of this round table, and I'd like to thank the organisers for including me. Films about Indigenous people have been around for a long time now. Nanook of the North was the first documentary slash ethnographic film made about the Indigenous Inuit people, and many have followed suit. With its colonial beginnings, films about indigenous people in the Himalayas are at plenty too. Films have always been made about us, often as a way to document the colourful world, the changing livelihood, or the vanishing cultures, forgetting that our lives are not static remnants of an exoticised past. Our stories have always been told by someone else, but we see the dawn of an indigenous filmmaker like Suwish Debi Limbu and others that are telling us about uncertain Himalayan futures. 
Time difference, time travel, and interrogating the concept of time is central to Ningwaso, as it examines the philosophy of time from our own cultural and spatial context, making, e making it easier to understand the different worlds that we live in. Limbu's film is extraordinary in capturing the timescapes and continuity from one world to another, as it begins with the stones and rocks, which are the earliest tools and technology of humankind. I like the connection of the timelines of challenges. You either work with us or you don't. Indigenous people across the Himalayas are familiar with this rhetoric when we have resisted so-called development in our rivers and mountains. The state not only extracts, but also accuses and corners either you are with us or against us for the various development projects that they promote. While the storyline might seem different, when I look at Ningwa Suam, I'm reminded of a lecture film, Dokbu, meaning The Keeper of the Land, which was released in 2017. Made by Dawa Lecture, an indigenous filmmaker from Sikkim, the film takes place in Maoliang, the lecture country where different stories of the mountains and rivers gets told. The indigenous practices of lecture lifeways are visually represented as it moves in an adventurous pace, with Dokbu and a female researcher wanting to learn about the wrong people. Lectures have been the most studied community in Sikkim, and this film addresses the interaction of lectures with researchers that has been happening since colonial times till the present day. Dawa Lecture is also able to skillfully weave time in similar ways that feel easily explainable to an indigenous mind. For example, at the end of the, at the, end of the movie, the researcher thinks that she was lost for three days, but she was actually gone for three months. Some local reviews around the movie talked about how they were not able to comprehend the time difference. In that, I see many similarities and draw points from Ningwasun's point of the relativeness of time. Our sense of time and space is not uniform, and now the colonisers are different from our now. They live in certain fragments of time that they created and can't let go of. Ningwasun is also equally, culturally, equally and culturally loaded with different insignias and symbols of Yaktun culture that make subtle impressions throughout the film. From the appearance of the spaceship to the space suit of the time travellers with detailed patches of the mountains, stars and moon, and the takapna technique that allows us to listen to the sound of the hand looms going chikling chikling as Miksam talks about his strongest memory. It is in the weaving of Yaktun tradition that is visible in the, it is the weaving of Yaktun tradition that is visible in the emblems and the lim, and the limbu silam sakma that feels like the guiding light of the spaceship. The details of Miksam Mother's shawl makes its appearance every now and then, and also shows, shows the warmth and continuity of ancestral law and the wisdom that will hopefully be passed down from generation to generation. Even the hardy boots worn by Miksam and Miksomma have the Limbu script engraved on them and tell their own story of how indigenous language has been key to the narration of the film. Of course, for us non-Limbus, we have to rely on subtitles, but the fact that the film was made in Yatun language means the authority rests in the Yaktong language speakers. I find inspiration and comfort on the characters of our indigenous films who are able to weave ancestral wisdom and tackle the various challenges of our precarious times. Miksam, Miksomma and Dokbu are our heroes, our indigenous superheroes from the Himalayas who are here to guide and strengthen our existence as we tackle the uncertain futures of the Anthropocene. We must be on the winning side to have our time travels and travellers and keepers of the land help us reimagine our Himalayan indigenous futures. Thank you. Hi everyone. Uh, thank you so much for organizing this panel and for inviting us. Uh, so my short presentation will actually make two points about the same films uh, that Karishma talked about. Um, who? Next. Who? Okay. So, Dongbo is the film that Kershaw was talking about that is made by Dawa Lecha, who is also an anti dam activist. And my research in Sikkim was about an uh, indigenous anti dam movement uh, led by the Lecha or the Rong community. Um, so, I'll be drawing some of these kind of parallels uh, between uh, the two films, uh, but focusing specifically on two points uh, A, the use of indigenous language uh, in both the films. Uh, I won't talk so much about the language because Amy has already talked about that and Karishma too. Uh, and the second uh, point is this idea of the particularity of sacred landscapes. Um, and I'll spend more time talking about the second point. Um, so for the last two decades, the Indian and the Nepali Himalayan region have witnessed a profound landscape transformation uh, because of a number of things, but uh, my main focus, uh, research focus has been on hydropower infrastructure in this region. Uh, so hydropower is but one of the many technologies of development uh, that is bringing a lot of infrastructural change in this region. And of course, these projects are bringing in a lot of revenue for the state, um, 
uh, through private contracts, the sale of electricity. Um, uh, Vijay was talking about this yesterday, about uh, even the sale of electricity from Nepal to uh, India. Uh, so, and there's also corruption at all levels. So there's a lot of money to be made. Um, so it's a very lucrative uh, economic uh, uh, project. But building these projects in the Himalayan region, which is seismically active, uh, landslide prone and uh, receives the bulk of monsoonal rains uh, comes with its own challenges. And this was a display uh, most recently in Sikkim. So this is from Sikkim, uh, and this was October 2020, uh, uh, last year basically, um, uh, where um, a glacial big outburst flood uh, completely kind of wiped away, uh, swept away this, uh, the Tista Safe Street Dam, uh, which is in North Sikkim. And um, this, um, and I can talk more about that later. And uh, the 2015 uh, earthquake in Nepal also kind of damaged a lot of the uh, earthquake, uh, the hydropower infrastructure in this region. So these uh, infrastructure is, is very susceptible to um, <clears throat> not just climate uh, disasters, but also earthquakes and, and uh, flash floods, right? So while neither Dokbu, the film, uh, or Ningwasum uh, mentioned dams specifically, uh, it is clear that both films are grappling with questions of threats uh, to uh, indigenous landscapes that are revered as sacred by uh, the Lepcha of the Rong community and the Yaktung nation. So they invite us to consider how the indigenous communities persevere and persist in the face of these threats. Uh, according to Dava and Subhash, by, uh, they do so by narrating stories in indigenous languages to keep the memories of historical struggles and indigenous sovereignty alive. Uh, the film Thokbu was filmed entirely in the uh, Zongbu Reserve in Mexican, uh, which is a protected tribal reserve uh, exclusively kind of earmarked for the Lepcha of the Rong community and is revered as sacred to the tribe. Uh, the storyline, as uh, Karishma was talking about, follows a journey of a research scholar uh, who uh, gets lost in Zongbu while on a research trip. Uh, and encounters garden deity Thokbu, who protects her from a demonic force while also narrating stories and myths of the lands uh, while he takes her to a village. And that's where she kind of thinks she's lost for three days, but she's actually lost for three months. Uh, Thokbu switches between English and Lepcha, with Thokbu, the, the keeper, speaking only Lepcha, and the researchers speaking only English, but somehow they're able to understand each other. And there's uh, subtitles in English. Um, so Lepcha language is considered to be an endangered uh, language with a number of native speakers uh, dwindling. So this was a very conscious decision by uh, Dala Lepcha, who's also the anti-Dan uh, activist. Uh, so the story that he's sharing here is a story of Mount Kanchen uh, Zonga or Mount Kanchen Chu uh, in uh, Lepcha, uh, and the story of the origin of the first Lepcha man and woman uh, made by the creator Ipu Devu Rum. Uh, Zongu is understood to be a Maya Liang, the birthplace of the Lepchas, and has an abundance of stories and myth mythologies etched in every nook and corner. Uh, so that's he's talking about our elder brother, Kong Chen Chu, in this uh, still. So in a similar kind of vein in the scene in Nguasun, Mixum is telling us, the viewer, the significance of rocks in Yakton culture. And Subhash shared this on a different panel that Amy and Kalzana uh, had organized that rocks are a very important object for Yaptun people, and we see this in the film. In ancient times, if there was a conflict, rocks would be erected as a memorial, uh, as a capsule for uh, communication. And he talked about how these, uh, they had these encryptions, kind of he uses technological language. Uh, let me take a bit, like maybe two minutes. <laughs> So stones are still one of the mediums, he said, that last the longest, uh, more than even microchips. So both um, Dobu and Ningwasung demonstrate the rootedness and landscape that speaks to the particularity of sacred landscapes. Uh, and what Sue Scholar, Vine Deloria Jr., Jr. calls the particularity of revelation. In his book, God is Red, a native view of religion, he makes this argument for the significance of sacred landscapes to indigenous communities as a challenge to religious universalism. He writes, in the Western tradition, and I would add in the Indian context, the Hindutva national tradition, uh, what has been the manifestation of deity in a particular local situation is mistaken for a truth applicable to all times and places, a truth so powerful that it must be impressed upon peoples who have no connection to the event or to the cultural complex in which it originally made sense. American Indian other tribal peoples did not take this path in interpreting revelations and religious experiences. The vast majority of Indian tribal religions have a sacred center at a particular place, 
be it a river, a mountain, a plateau, valley, or other natural feature. This center enables the people to look out along the four dimensions and locate their land to relate all historical events within the confines of this particular land and to accept responsibility for it. Sacred places thus inform us of the particularity of revelation, that it is not a universal message to be placed in secular or immature hands for distribution. Rather, it is as intimate as our own personal thoughts that we would never utter in profane ears. In the current conjuncture, we see rising militarism and Hindu nationalism in the Himalayan region, while hydropower projects, roads and railway buildings, and disasters are the most visible signs of the current time. This is just the tip of the proverbial, proverbial iceberg. And I want to skip over this next um, uh, uh, slide, but it's from uh, Akhidul Langumar, who also talks about Hindu nationalism uh, in the Himalayan region and this idea of the Greater India Project. Um, and I can talk about this more in Q&A. Uh, but just to kind of uh, uh, wrap up, um, today the Eastern Himalayan region is um, key to the Indian state's uh, Lukis policy that envisions it as a gateway to Southeast Asia, alluding to India's ancient Silk Road ties with its eastern neighbors. Um, the Lepchas, alongside many other indigenous communities across North, North India and the broader Himalayan region, are resisting these uh, nationalisms and these universalisms, and they make a strong case for indigenous sovereignty and their ties to the land, reminding us that the nation state is a recent invention, but the land and its people have and will persist into the future. Thank you. My name is Elspeth Iralu. Um, I'm really excited to be here with all of you. I feel like it's such a privilege to um, be in conversation with people whose work I treasure and am very inspired by. Um, so thank you all. Um, what I want to share today is not about either of the films that we've heard about, um, but it has to do with kind of time, space, and relation, and how, um, how storytelling about rice um, recounts kind of genealogies that connect us um, to past, present, and future. Um, and this is a very brief version of a paper that I'm writing with Lota Naga anthropologist Dali Kikon. Um, and so I want to share what I think we see as the heart of the paper, which is something we'd call Naga Pedagogies of Love. Um, in this paper, Dali and I, two Naga scholars working both within and outside of Naga territories, consider Naga storytelling about rights as an embodied Naga pedagogy of love that enacts Naga futurity in the here and now. Rhymes and stories about rice narrate shifting relations to kin and land that can expand and contract as a child's or an adult's world and memory grow. Gestures like squeezing rice in a palm or measuring a ratio of rice to water with your knuckles mark embodied physical relations to family, food, water, and land. These measures are neither static nor are they able to be infinitely scaled up for increased growth or output. Instead, these measures trace relationships that can't be severed from the person who experiences them. Naga storytelling about rice is accompanied by measurements taken with one's hands, which are always particular to one's individual body, a process of measuring with rather than measuring up. And we're seeing this in some ways as a critique of uh, development practices in Northeast India. Dominant modes of development rely on continuous scalability over time. Development projects are successful only as long as they continually set new targets for increasing output, range, or reach. These standards are created elsewhere and expect indigenous peoples to measure up to standards we cannot create and compare ourselves against other peoples while drawing on dominant epistemologies to which we have no relation. As a result, scalable development models become the organizing principles for governance, political resolutions, and market economy. So in contrast, we want to explore forms of social economy and relations that are embedded in indigenous community and society. And so we explore accounts of reciprocity that engage Naga pedagogies of love, linking past, present, and future. As development projects function as scalable measurements to define and govern indigenous communities, economic progress and growth in indigenous communities are measured in every way possible. So rather than view units of measurements as fixed, neutral modes of making sense of complexity, we see units of measurements as expressions of political and epistemological claims and assumptions. Privileging Naga ways of knowing invites a critique of the very units of measurement through which Naga progress is measured up against development goals. So in this paper, we're considering indigenous measurements at the scale of the body as a way of accounting for, remembering, and narrating relations across time. Dali grew up in Dimapur, which is an urban center in the foothills of Nagaland, 
but her grandparents came from the Lotonaga village of Sungiki in Woka district. Um, although she didn't meet her relatives and elders from the village regularly, her mother taught her to connect with names and relations by performing a rhyme during mealtime. Taking a fistful of cooked rice and pressing it into a ball, Dolly's mother taught her the names of cousins, grandparents, and relatives, and then later pets and neighbors and friends were also added to the rhyme, reciting the names of loved ones with blessings as she squeezed the rice. Dolly says, these kinds of rhymes were forms of knowledge and played a significant role in teaching indigenous children about relationships and ties. The rhyme changes as the child grows up. It's about the past, present, and future all at once. It's a memory keeper. The Zumsu rhyme is about the relational aspect of life." Unquote. Making a fistful of Zumsu also meant teaching children learning to eat with their hands, not to waste food. The design of the rice ball formed in the child's hand was just right for the child to hold and savor, not too much or too little, connecting the child to making meaning in the Lotanaga world. Small mundane activities like squeezing a fistful of rice are central in keeping record, expanding relationships, and making sense of the world. For Angami Nagas, each rice variety has an emergent story that indicates origin and relationship. A favorite variety for Western Angamis, like my family, um, we're from Konoma village, is called Kekrilha, and it translates kind of roughly to love rice. Um, I've heard several origin stories for Kekrilha. One version of the story is that the variety came to Angamis when an Angami woman fell in love with a man from another tribe, and he gave her the rice seeds as a gift, and then they proliferated throughout Angami villages. Another version of the story says that Kekrilha bears this name to indicate the feeling we have when we give the rice we grow to others so they can cook it and eat themselves. I'm gonna go 30 seconds over. <laughs> Another version says that the feeling of love indicated by the name is the relationship between people and the rice variety itself. So when we eat kekrilha, we can feel the love of the rice emanating from our bellies to our heart, head, hands, and feet. This physical feeling of love and connection makes us think of our relationship to the rice field and to the rice seeds and to the time spent nurturing the rice. These rice origin stories are not just historical and cultural records or genealogies, but they're ways of measuring, accounting for, and indicating accountability to our relations in the current moment and into the future. The origin stories tell us who we are in relation with and what our responsibilities are within those relationships. Rice farmers told me that they grow high yield rice varieties when they're producing rice to sell in the market because it's easier to make a profit that way. But for themselves, their families, and their villages, um, they grow the traditional varieties that carry stories and embedded relationships. These varieties satiate the appetite as well as the desire for social, political, and genealogical connection. Kekrilha holds a web of relations between humans, non-humans, water, and land. This web of relations is expansive, referring to a wide variety of human and non-human relations, and it is specific, referring to the personal bodily experience of good feelings emanating from the belly. While colonial development initiatives mark indigenous households as units of analysis of poverty and addiction, violence and unemployment, income and migration, focusing on stories of Zumsu and Kekrilha enables us to theorize indigenous ways of knowing and being. The feelings of kinship generated by these stories and actions cannot be collapsed into a quantitative variable or a research goal. Narrating these stories is a rejection of the pressure to measure ourselves against development goals that mark us in the past tense as underdeveloped, primitive, and remote. Within a Naga pedagogy of love, we're connected to relations past and future, well nourished by our relationships to community, land, and race. Thank you. float serenely across technicolor skies, the images immediately evoking in a messy simultaneity, simultaneity the feeling of a Loraki village grounded and earthen, as well as the surreal flight of imagination of a, a Miyazaki world, the bent time and place of a Dali landscape, and a complex relationship to time. Jigmet's work is forcefully futuristic. 
dependent on technique and references to the art world, but also somehow timeless. Seeing these images, I'm caught by how they're at once deeply grounded in the materials that tie these structures to earth, the earth and bricks, the whitewash, the branches and fodder on the roof for animals, yet the structures themselves have become unmoored from the earth and travel through space. I think of Tsuan Motuk, who generously sent me and Mabel his portfolio of work, including a complexly layered image of migratory birds of Ladakh scattered across an urban Indian landscape. Motuk tells me Ladakhi youth are like these birds. In the work of these and other artists, I'm taken by the ways that their work both references and disrupts Ladakh as a place, and by how Ladakh is celebrated in ways that are dependent on transcending that place but how also a vision of Ladakh persists. That is, how the imagery can create an infrastructure of remembrance. I'm interested in how we do tricks with time to claim territory both now and in the present and future. So I was so excited to see these films as I'm working on a new book, maybe, I don't know, thinking about <laughs> the relationship between time and land and how we use tricks with time to claim or change our relationship to land. And I'm doing this thinking about education and universities as temporal infrastructure, both in Ladakh, but then also uh, where I work, University of North Carolina. So I've been thinking about how colonization is also a strategy to force the whole world onto one timeline. And I felt like that came up so strongly in the films. So I was like thrilled to see those. You can see, um, I liked also this line, the way you recollect memories produces different realities and different times. And I was thinking how I see that in the work of Ladakhi artists. Um, okay, so let's see. Um, so I'm thinking on how time itself is racialized and how sweeps of time are codified into eras, work I've done with Mabel, Andrew Curley, Pavitra Vasudevan, and others, and in when and how timelines end or begin. And this emerges so beautifully in Mwasun. Um, and also in the work of indigenous scholars, many of whom observe that native people have already survived apocalypse and it's white peoples and settlers who fear a coming apocalypse. So time is racialized and colonized at these different and intersecting scales. Okay, but that's too much to say. Um, so in the book, I'm trying to work between like my work in Ladakh and then together with Danielle Purifoy, um, a black geographer, and the American Indian Center at my university, where we've started this land back abolition project trying to understand the place that we're in. So I'm trying to think across these scales, but I'm not gonna talk about that in six minutes. Um, in Ladakh, I'm thinking about how young Ladakhis manage the time question and their desire to bring the Ladakh they love with them into the future. So this summer, I was with somebody, some of y'all have met in the back there, Sasha. We're walking around our neighborhood in Ladakh. And this is the first time I've seen this kind of graffiti. So this was uh, last last July. So it's six, six schedule for Ladakh. This is right in our neighborhood. Mm -hmm. um, and it also happens to be like, this is like a place that's been, um, the landscape's kind of wrecked by a, a big flood that happened mm -hmm. a couple years back. So that was also meaningful. Um, so as you know, as many of you know, in September of, uh, in August of 2019, there was this bifurcation of Jammu and Kashmir, now Ladakh is a union territory, but folks have been wanting Ladakh to get this sixth schedule, be included in the sixth schedule. And in this struggle, I've been really taken by how folks are evoking land as kind of a lodestone and a, a guiding force. So I could write a whole book about this one article <laughs> because of how, so we have this headline, Ladakh is like a colony governed by governed by officers from far off places, and this is this guy Amchuk, and he's also like he gets introduced to the presumably Indian audience by saying like you remember three idiots, yeah. <laughs> uh, and three idiots is of course how Ladakhis talk about like oh three idiots introduced Ladakh to India, and that's why we have a different kind of tourism now. So there's like so much happening right here, but I have only one minute. <laughs> so, <laughs> Amchuk says uh, in this interview, what is six schedule, why, why fast unto death for it? It wasn't for unto death, it was 21 days, so like, <laughs> anyway. Um, so he says, in Ladakh, we are trying to do everything possible to safeguard the mountains. And he talks about the need for six schedule to, to uh, safeguard the mountains. And I think it's interesting here how decolonization is placed in a confusing manner, both backward and forward in time. On the one hand, because it was part of a princely state, there was not an anti-colonial battle in it, like a conventional sense of Ladakh. 
But then now there's this talk of decolonizing Iran to free it from, you know, India. Not to free it from India, but to change its relationship to India. So we have this kind of like mixed, messy, mixed up timeline that I think is really interesting. Um, so in thinking about these ideas, this is so jumpy because I put three things together. In thinking about these ideas, I loved thinking through um, these ideas that have been on my mind through the film. So I love this idea of my now has arisen from the apocalypse. This really ties with like Kyle White, other indigenous scholars who are talking about we indigenous people already survived the apocalypse. It's y'all who are scared, you white settlers. Um, and then I also have been thinking about the ways that colonizers and white settlers try to create a fixity of time to like structure relations in this colonial way and like keep that going into the future through different kinds of infrastructure. Um, and that could be like infrastructure of dams, but it could also be infrastructure of education. Mm -hmm. I feel like this comes out so beautifully in the film, in this idea of like, for instance, the now of the colonizers, racist, capitalist, and romantical patriar patriarchs is completely different from your now. And he says, and uh, the narrator tells us like, they live in certain fragments of time they created and don't want to let go of. And I felt like that's so telling in this ways that we see colonization trying to put everyone on this one timeline and saying like, you all are back in time, we are the future of you, and this is the structure through which we're going to bring you there on our terms. So I felt like um, this film really does this work so beautifully, both of kind of deconstructing colonial efforts to like put us all on this one timeline, and then also evoking like others have already spoken to kind of like beautiful indigenous ways of kind of resisting that and reformulating relations to land through desire. Um, so it's 4 to 12, so I think we can at least have five minutes uh, for <laughs> <laughs> the panel that we have here, you know, there used to be a time when, you know, there used to be only one or two indigenous speakers, and so to see that we actually have seven people struggling to finish um, <laughs> what we have to say, uh, I think that's an indication of how the field itself has grown and how vibrant the field is, and I just returned from the Association of Asian Studies meeting, and uh, where I was part of uh, indigenous-focused uh, uh, sessions, and it was really uh, a hard thing to see that uh, our sessions were one of the most uh, pack uh, sessions well attended. Mm -hmm. And so it's just an indication of how uh, conversations have shifted and how there's more visibility and more interest and uh, meaningful engagement with uh, the topic and, uh, and more space for individual speakers to uh, present. So with that, any one or two comments? <laughs>